Good. What would Beyonce do with the microphone? That's, uh, she won't need a microphone. She won't need a microphone. Yeah, fair. Right. Like an opera singer. That, or she just goes like this. She finds the people that That's ride right. with the singer for There we go. Is it better on the volume? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, Marcus, I wonder if you might just sort of start by telling us um, one of your favorite stories, one of the campaigns you thought, this is actually going to be a challenge. And how, how did it actually, um, did you overcome this and it went through, sort of generally speaking? Sure. So I think um, probably one of the bigger challenges I had, both as a, as a practitioner and sort of as a human working in the space, was the Brooklyn Nets. Mm, so uh, Brooklyn Nets at this time was the New Jersey Nets. Um, if you're not familiar with the New Jersey Nets, they were a failing basketball team. <laughs> I never won a championship. Um, at best, got to the finals and got totally demolished. Um, and the New Jersey Nets got purchased by a, uh, we call them the Russian, and he was going to move the New Jersey Nets over to, to Brooklyn, which had all its issues. A, a failing team moving to a city that's very proud of itself, doesn't work very well. And anything New Jersey and Brooklyn never goes well. But while this is happening also, there is, um, they're going to be building an arena in a very historical part of Brooklyn called um, Atlantic Terminal. And the erection of this new, the erecting of this new facility was going to push a lot of people out of their homes, like small businesses were going to go away. So it is a really, really big issue. So the, the challenge that was given to us was how do you make the Brooklyn Nets to Brooklyn what the Knicks are to Manhattan? It's just not an easy feat. And most people think about the value propositions, how do we talk about what it means to have a team and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the way we solved it is that we brought a page from Edward Bernays' propaganda theory. And the idea is that you can bring people together by declaring an enemy of the state. And we knew that Brooklynites are the most proud borough in New York City. Um, so we decided to stoke Brooklyn pride by creating a badge of honor, a badge of identity for themselves and establish a rivalry between Brooklyn and Manhattan. So through a lot of executions, essentially, we, um, we established that Brooklyn and New York have this rivalry that exists. Let's stoke the flames of that by stoking the pride of, of Brooklyn. And once the dust settled, Brooklynites would then buy Brooklyn Nets gear, go to Brooklyn Nets games, be Brooklyn Nets fans as a badge of their identity, tap into the cultural zeitgeist. It worked out really well, which was awesome. But as I look back as a human, you know, we didn't really solve the problem. We solved the problem for the client, but there's a bigger issue at hand, moving people, displacing people from their homes, um, disrupting the local economy that I don't think we ever really mm. uh, facilitated. So while was, I look back to that as a success, as a practitioner, it's always like kind of wrestling in the back of my mind, what could we have done in a more, uh, a more powerful and sustainable way. Yeah, so sort of building on that, this duality you have both in academia but also in the real world, what are some of the, the key insights you've taken um, by having sort of foot in both of these worlds and, and sort of the opportunity not just to teach and to do but to really sort of change the way we think about these things from a practitioner and academic perspective? Yeah, so you know, this was not the goal for me. I had no clue. I was an awful student. I had no interest in going back to school. The fact actually when Got, got to Ross to get my master's is like God, for sure. Um, so I had no, no intentions on being in the classroom. It wasn't until I was working advertising, I was running the social practice at an agency in, in New York called Translation, and I had a conversation with a, a, a friend who was working in social work, and she was like, yeah, my work is all about people. I mean, that's why it's social work. And I was like, huh, social means people. And here I am running the social media practice at an agency and realizing I knew nothing about people. I was an engineer, what are you gonna do? Um, and, you know, Engineers I, are people too. Indeed, but we don't study humanities by any stretch. Right? I took like one sociology class and like slept through it my freshman year, it was awful, which is why my GPA sucked. Um, so I had this kind of Jerry Maguire moment, this epiphany that social is people, that means social media has to be the media of people. And I remember telling my wife, I was like, I'm a fraud. I thought about social, thinking about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Tumblr, Snapchat, and the alike, where social is about people. That's just a fraction of what social is. So my wife said, well, you know, you should probably start reading. Like, you need to get to work. You need to get to reading. And the first book I read was Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational. Mm -hmm. And it rang a bell that I couldn't unring. This idea that 
we have these heuristics, these cognitive shortcuts that we take that inform the majority of our decisions on a daily basis, mm. and that it's so it's so salient in the decisions we make um, regularly in our behaviors that it's predictable. And if we can understand the the the, the underlying physics of how we cognate and the decisions that we make then we can have a better understanding of how people move in these social yeah. environments. And I read Danny Ariely, I went back and read the book, I read the research that was cited in the book, then I started reading those people which led me to, uh, to Kahneman, it led me to Dunbar, to Watts, to Heath, and you know, before long it started to become self-referential. And interestingly, about a year and a half into this kind of exploration, I found myself in, um, in a, a brainstorm of sorts, someone's like, yeah, if we get Jay-Z to tweet it, everybody would do it. It's like, it's not how influence works. And I'm watching myself like regurgitate the theory, like an outer body experience. I'm like, look at you, Marcus, look at you, buddy. And I don't think it's happening. Um, and what I realized is that the more I understood the scholarship, the better the work became. And the better work became, the more curious I became with the scholarship. Mm. And it became this cyclic sort of uh, this stick was sort of a, a, belong, a being that allowed me to be both, I guess, impactful in the classroom by having yeah. real world things to apply to the concepts, but then being also very thoughtful in the boardroom by applying the causality based theory to the work. Yeah, like this Kurt Lewin, there's nothing more practical than a good theory moment. Seriously, almost. absolutely. So, thinking, so marketing, you wouldn't normally think about impact in the way that, say, the studio or business plus impact is really defining it, really trying to move the needle on issues like poverty, on water security, and issues like this. Um, where do you see the, not just the relevance, but the need for some of the perspectives that you bring to the table in helping really accelerate those preferable futures? Yeah, we have to widen the aperture of how we think about marketing. We typically think about it in the perspective of econ, right? It's like this is about selling and exchanges. And while, yes, like the 1900s, that's how marketing was seen. That was the perspective which marketing was, was, um, was practiced. But over the years, we realized that you know, the insights, consumer insights that, that, economy, that economics gives us is only a fraction of what people really are, which is why we started using psychology, and then sociology, and then you know, understanding culture. And the idea is that marketing at its core is about going to market, right? As our good friend, Professor John Branch would say, marketing is going to market, right? Well, what is the market? Market is people, right? We go to the people with products, product goods, product services, and we do this all in an effort to get people to move which means the core function of marketing is about getting people to adopt behavior beyond just a transactional perspective, whether it's I want you people to vote for me, don't, don't go to his party, go to my party, don't go to her church, go to my church. Everything we do as marketers should be in service of getting people to move, right? And it's not just about commercial movement, i.e. getting people to consume, but it's about getting people to make decisions that as a populace would probably benefit them individually as well as... Um, the, the broader public. Yeah, you were so in the studio. So I mean, business can be done in for good, for evil, and and from the dean all the way throughout many of the faculty. This idea that Ross, okay, going to be agnostic to some extent, but there's a, sort of this core opportunity to have uh, ways in which leveraging business to do good, to make a positive force yeah. in the organization, uh, in the society, and also using sort of the impact studio as leverage. So you were talking with some of the students, working on uh, helping them with some of their challenges of saying, what are some um, populations at risk or vulnerable populations, um, and how might they be able to get social capital needed to really have a better odds of getting into a good school or yeah. getting an internship or getting a job? Um, to, from your perspective, what would be sort of your, your call to arms for others in marketing to sort of apply their forces and their, their ingenuity and their tools and frameworks to accelerating these things, which, as you mentioned, are not just simply how many people click here or yeah. change this. And I think you talked about cultural change more deeply. Yeah. No, I think when I think about the best marketing, or rather, when we think about the, the marketing executions that seem to predictably um, arrive at the behaviors that we want, they typically focus on relieving points of friction, right? Identifying points of friction and relieving them for people. Because not only do people want help, Right? Not only do we want you know, things to be frictionless and be, be less problematic, but those are things that we share as well. 
It's like, hey, man, I just watched this new show. You got to watch it. Jeff. You love it. Right. We tell people about these things because me being able to help you makes us tighter. Mm. And we are, as Aristotle would say, social animals by nature. We do everything we can to connect to each other and providing these these um, this, these objects, whether it's information, whether it's experiences, data between each other help endear us to each other. Not only does it make us connected, but it also establishes us within the, hi- the, the, the social hierarchy. All of these things that happen culturally inform the behaviors that we take on. And if brands can empower us or enable us with the ability to do that by helping us, it puts them in a far better situation. Right? So this is moving beyond value propositions to help me. Mm. Right? And, and could you say a little more when you talk about sort of propagation and getting ideas to spread? So, uh, and take you know, some of the projects that uh, have been identified. Let, let's take one for example. So one of our faculty in marketing, Yeshem, has published uh, just a scholarly article on how one of the, way, one of the many ways it's expensive to be poor. And okay. part of it is you can't take advantage of bulk uh, purchasing like others. Mm-hmm. You can't take advantage of coupons that come out on the third of the month when people are paid often on the first of the yep. month. So there's just this idea, this research thing published that hasn't had any impact yet. That's right. Yet. Right. Um, what are sort of your thoughts, like in ex- using that as an example that we could pull from some of your expertise of, well, here's the many different ways that could propagate. Yes. So... So the research I, I did like some, some years ago is this idea of, for lack of better words, cultural contagion. That's how we refer to it, okay. right? But we call it cultural that was propagation. So, it was so yesterday. Yes, propagation, exactly. I like yes. it. Okay. Yeah. Cultural propagation. And the idea is this, and this may be a little long-winded, but I want to kind of provide some foundation. The idea is this, that um, there's things that spread that we call, quote, unquote, viral. Um, but there are things that spread and take hold. And that the things that spread and take hold are far more powerful than things that just kind of propagate. Right, um, and for the, the for the sake of the nomenclature, you know, we think a lot about contagion as I touch you, you get sick. Right, that's kind of switch our language. I know, but just for the sake, <laughs> just, just, we think about spreading as still. I, 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 what are you gonna do? I mean, come on. The title of the thing is social contagion. What are you gonna do? <laughs> um, the, the, you know that that is referred to as like simple contagion, right? From one to one. Yeah. But people don't move because of simple contagion. It, call, it requires complex contagion. That is, I have redundancy of exposure from multiple people, and it reduces um, resistance that I would have to take on a behavior. So, you know, so I've been working in digital media, social media for, for a pretty long time, and I got really interested in this idea of virality because marketers love this notion. Like, I target this people, I spend money to get them, and then they go talk about it, and then everybody else does it. Amazing, give me that all day long. And while in theory that sounds great, in reality we realize it doesn't really work that way. There are things that you've seen and you, haha, that was great, but never shared it or never talked about it, or if you did, you didn't take an action after the fact. So it, it created the question for me, is there something more powerful than just simple pass along? Um, and so I started like, you know, digging into the dark, the dark edges of the, the World Wide Web. Um, and somehow or another, I landed at Avatar. Stay with me here. So Avatar, at the time, highest grossing movie ever made. One may say Avatar has gone viral, right, at that point. I've seen it three times, two, two times in the movie theater, in, in 3D, IMAX. And while I was doing the research, I couldn't remember the lead character's name, which I thought was just super interesting. I've seen this movie so many times, spend a boatload of money watching it in an IMAX theater in New York, and couldn't remember the lead character's name. Then I started asking people that I know who've seen it also, and they couldn't remember his name either. And you're probably thinking, what is that dude's name? It's like Han Solo. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Wrong movie. Right. But so and I thought that was super fascinating because at the time of the research, Frozen had come out. And I knew the lead character's name, Elsa. I knew the words to let it go. Right. If, if I was in a conversation with someone and they said, oh, just let it go, Marcus. My mind my heart was, let it go, let it go. <laughs> right. I had never seen the movie before, but I knew all of these things, which I thought was just absolutely fascinating. Right? And what, it, what I realized is that while Frozen, um, I knew all these things of the movie, it became the number one most requested song in karaoke. It was the ho- number one Halloween costume of uh, 2014. It was the number one baby name of 2014. Like This became the most successful animated movie, but unlike 
avatar didn't just spread from person to person to person. It took hold in culture. Mm. And that is just far more powerful. So we think about things like Yeshem's paper, for instance, or the, 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 um, what she's uncovered in her research. It's not just about how do we get the word out. It's how do we get the word out and make sure that the behaviors stick. Right, mm-hmm. that people take on behaviors that help undo some of those mm-hmm. systematic injustices. Yeah, nice. So um, that was a sort of round. You lost me at Frozen. I think this, I is, a, this is a children's movie. <laughs> yeah. um, so this idea of when it sticks and changes is actually really um, interesting. The one last question I would like to really open it up to the to the audience here is: What do you see as some of the unique challenges of? designing solutions for impact, whether they're intra-organizational solutions, uh, big societal changes, products or services. What, they're very sort of wicked problems that aren't clearly one company just trying to solve this problem, but that requires society. Yeah. So what's your sort of take on the challenges of getting cultural change with solutions that are really addressing wicked problems? It's understanding the operating system of society, which is culture. You know, we, we tend to think about the way we describe people is already flawed, right? We use demography to describe who people are. We just don't accurately describe who they are, right? I'm 40 years old, African-American, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, with the public school my entire life. If a marketer saw that on a sheet of paper, they say, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, and do those things because that's just what those kind of people do, right? And while, yes, I am 40, I am black, and I am from Detroit, Right, that doesn't give rise to the fact that I grew up playing jazz as a kid, or I swam competitively, which is a big stereotype break. Right, or that I was an engineer. These things shape how I see the world and ultimately how I behave in the world. That is, there are cultural characteristics that are associated with that because of my world view, and because we don't describe people accurately, we end up missing all the cultural undercurrents that actually drive their behaviors. Culture, the beliefs that we hold, the artifacts that have meaning, mm. the behaviors that are normative, the language that we use, these things are the operating system of society and, this is, and the cultural affiliation that we have within society. And if marketers, politicians, organizations, NGOs, or the like, if the, if, the, if the aspiration is to get people to move in mass or, or in concert, then we have to understand the cultural characteristics that guide their behavior, which requires radical empathy and extreme intimacy and understanding people. And unfortunately, a lot of marketers don't think about people as human beings or we don't have enough time to have enough time to actually spend the time getting to know who they are. Yeah, actually, so in the design process, we often talk about understanding the initial problem statement, putting it aside, and then doing this ethnography deep dive. Absolutely. Where you're doing social network analysis, tools from sociology, yeah. ethnography from anthropology, behavioral experiments. Um, what you're saying is, and that's sort of news to me, that marketers don't think of that. I thought precision segmentation is uh, part of it. And what you're saying is it's basically like playing guitar with gloves. It's just a really broad yeah. I mean, way think of about carving this. it out. Think about, you know, marketers say, we've got to get those millennials. Millennials are defined by an age group. I think they're older than millennials, right? right? Or Gen Zs. They get those, get after those Gen Zs, right? Yeah. Defined by an age group. That's like saying everybody 35 to 55 are all the same. It's stupid. It's absolutely dumb, right? But marketers bet the farm after this, you know, this constructed population of people that are only thing they have in common is that they were born at the same time. It's like saying all women love to shop. Or all black people do something fill in the blank racist. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. One of the ways, sort of, in the impact zone, in the impact sort of ecosystem, one of the ways, one of the examples of this is this notion of financial literacy. If only the poor knew how to better deal with money, uh, and it turns out, well, they're actually better than most in dealing with money because when you have very few resources, you have to be very good at exactly. managing. Exactly, really sort of like big ahas yep. when you do this ethnography. Um, questions from the anything you have from there? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to pick out your notion around like subscribing versus. So yeah. um, I worked at DraftKings previously before the end of oh, yeah. the day, and, and we focused very much on direct response marketing, right? Like put out an offer that someone will then go do an act. Yep. How do you advise companies to think about like real brand building and, and think about subscribing and putting that messaging out when you know when we have so many resources yep. versus messaging that gets someone to take an action and actually purchase? Right. If you could repeat the question for the online. Oh yes, yeah. so yeah, so the question becomes about um, Brand building versus what I say is performance-based marketing, right? right? That's the, 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 firm, the, the term we use now, right? That is, we, um, we segment people based upon actions that they take, 
um, look like audiences that predict what actions they might take based upon what other people have done. And then we create an incentive to get those people to act. Um, so the difference in those two things um, is that one, the, the performance-based marketing is based all off of transaction, right? It is transactional in nature. And what it means is that while people may move because you dangle a carrot in front of their face, as soon as you remove the carrot, I'm done, I'm out of here, right? right? It's sort of like, um, like razor blades, right? So if you sell razor blades and it has three, three blades, gets a really close shave, you're the man. But then when I say, I got four blades, dog, like, oh, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to Marcus, his is sharper, right? But then you're like, well, I got four blades and mine excretes aloe vera lotion. Well, I got five blades, then you got seven blades, and then we're, we're totally trying to out-innovate each other until there's 80 blades on the, the, the shaver, then what happens next? What's the only thing that can happen after that? The price has to drop. And then we find ourselves in commodity land, at which point no one cares. But the idea of brand, is brand allows us to supersede the value propositions, mm. because this isn't about my razor are sharper, my battery lasts longer, my car goes faster. This is about ideological alignment, congruence. And when the brand's belief is aligned with my belief, not only do I consume from the brand, but I use the brand to communicate my identity, even if the brand is just parody with this competitor set. I mean, Beats by Dre is the perfect example of this, right? Beats by Dre owns 46% of the market as of last year, right? Is Beats by Dre better than Bose? Probably not. Is it better than JBL? I'm obliged to say no because they're my client, right? <laughs> However, Beats by Dre dominates the market because me having Beats by Dre around my neck, I need to be consuming music, signals something about my identity. And identity, culture in this way, sidesteps all the conventional wisdoms of traditional marketing communications, right? So when we focus on developing, building a brand, all these brand effects come as a byproduct of it, not just because of quality, reputation, leadership, and imagery, but ideological mm -hmm. association. And this is why the relationship between consumption and culture are so tightly intertwined, because consumption by its very nature is a cultural act. What I buy, where I go, how I style myself, where I eat, how I hang out, where I travel, all these things are byproduct of the way I see the world, mm. which is being constructed by my cultural point of view. Could you, could you, so when we were thinking about designing some solutions for impact, one of the challenges I gave to sort of our entrepreneurial colleagues is, we, what's a model for a founderless venture? Yeah. So if we had a, a company which there's no founders, is that possible? Because everyone talks about the founders, private equity will come in, get rid of them anyhow. How could we establish something that could live uh, with all the requisite resources without the founders. Is it possible, do you think, for a similar thing to happen where there's no brand? You're changing culture, um, but there's no brand. There's no, no one entity that, that's it. Yep. So for example, I guess off the top of my head is a bad example, but recycling. There's no company pushing recycling. It's cultural yep. in that moment. But it was maybe it was public campaign, I don't recall. But what is your thought? Is it even plausible to think of a brandless Cultural change through marketing, a marketing lens. So it's hard. I mean, you know, I think about like products that were brandless. It's like when you're poor, you know, there's this cheese. And that's you buy, government cheese, right? And there aren't any differentiation about it. I mean, think about like the history of branding. Like we have brands because people were growing commodities, i.e. they're growing um, agriculture, they're growing weeds and wheat and whatnot, or I had livestock. And like you got your cows, you got the, the Sanchez Burks cows, got the Collins cows, and we go to market and you can't tell between which one is better, right? Which one is better? But well, we know which one is better. Well, mine is better because I sing to my cows <laughs> and I stroke my cows. I don't have cows. Right? So then there's, there's like there's love coming through the milk, right? Like my cows have love in the milk, right? But the only way you know that if you know there's a Collins cow. So what do we do? We burn a mark of ownership, a brand, mm. right? That is a, a signifier that says this is owned by me, and all the things that are associated with it are now, um, um, are now um, aggregated within mm. the, this product. So we think about brandless products. I mean, there is actually a, a brand called brand, Brandless. Brandless Impact, okay. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but, yeah. So, but we talk about products, so about product services, product goods, yeah. right? Even yeah. like product services, like impact um, entities that offer services without a brand they can only be evaluated on their value propositions. Mm -hmm. And if another organization does it better, then you're sort of Yeah, would this be akin to like open source, so open source software, where there could technically be a brand, but it's 
But even then, it's a brand like like a Firefox was like an open source thing, right? Mm-hmm. And people still uh, Python is a you know an open source thing, right? Wikipedia, open source thing, but yet the brand name with it comes uh, the mark of ownership with it comes a level of trust, a level of differentiation, mm. a level of proxy to quality, and ultimately a premium. Yeah. And the implication is that there's always going to be a group that that doesn't resonate for. Yeah. With social impact, there's this desire to not exclude anyone from your messaging because the way to have impact is to collect everyone. Yeah. How do you see successful people reconciling that difference? Yeah, so the question is, just rephrase the question, should I get it right? So in social impact, how do we segment in such a way that is inclusive as opposed to in thinking about a commercial enterprise Segmentation is about being exclusive. These are people that we think we can go after, we can convert, where in social impact, we want to touch as many people as possible. Now, I think that in principle, they still operate the same way. Because if you ask Coca-Cola, they want, every, they want a Coke to be uh, armless away from everybody and everybody drinks Coke. Though they segment to get the people who are most likely to convert. I think the same thing goes thinking about social impact. Who, what is the, the heterogeneous like cluster of people that are more inclined to adopt the behavior. And the idea is that we, de- we design to propagate a network effect. Right? This is back to, to propagation, cultural propagation, that we activate a network effect where this primary group of people, it then resonates out to a secondary group of people, which resonates out to a tertiary group of people. And before long, we find ourselves in a wider touch of people who weren't the direct people we went after originally. There'll always be laggards. There'll always be people who you really can't touch. The diffusion will either be too long or take too, or, or um, require too much effort that you don't really get them thinking about a cascading like effect. But if you activate a network effect, then we can start with these people who are the most demonstrative representation of who we want to go after and let those people become the vehicle by which the information was spread. So to build on it, would you say, in other words, you start and then you scale, or you start and spread as opposed to thinking we're only exclusion, focusing exclusively on this group? Yeah, so think about like um, the way marketing communication typically works if you think about the funnel, right? When we get as many people as possible, right? The bigger the market population, the better. And then we blast them with messages, and maybe we'll reach a percent of them. And then prayerfully, inshallah, that a 0.012% of them will convert. That's how marketers work, right? Go after massive group of people and let it go here. The idea of this is to invert the funnel, that we start with the people who are the most demonstrative representation of who we're trying to go after, the ideological congruence, and we activate those people to go preach the gospel on our behalf to people like them. And then it begins to propagate along the way. Not, this isn't a social impact idea um, example, but that's exactly what Uber did. Like Uber, there was no CMO of Uber until 2016. So for the first five years of Uber's existence, no one was responsible for marketing because we did the marketing for Uber. You're in New York trying to get a cab, and it's like, what are you doing? Idiot, you got a black car service in your pocket. Oh, man, this is sweet. Oh, this is amazing. And then now you go preach the gospel because it's identifying a point of friction and relieve it. And then when you're out to dinner with friends, like, this is unbelievable. Let me show you this thing. This is just what we do. And there's this great, this great quote that says, People don't tell people about their brand because they love your brand. They tell people about your brand because they love their friends. And we hip our friends to games so that they can make better decisions. And as a result, they benefit, but also it tightens our relationship because every time they benefit from that thing that I hip them to, they're like, that guy Marcus is great. I love him. Right? Uh, So the same thing goes here when we think about segmentation, that this is almost the benefit of, this is almost the advantage to social impact causes is that you don't have a lot of resources, so you have to be very judicious about how you activate the market. On the other hand, we think about commercial entities, they have a lot of money, is that where are we gonna dump all this money? They don't have a belief system, no ideology in most cases, so they're sort of just thinking about value propositions. On the social impact side, you have a belief system, an ideology, who out there is aligned with it, and how do we activate them to become conduits for the product service or product good? Nice. Did that help? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, Professor 
Colin, it's magical to have you here. A uh, question for you about something that I would love to see spread universally. Handshaking is the dumbest and most barbaric thing ever. <laughs> yes, every public health expert, they would say, for God's sakes, do not shake hands. Yeah. And even fist bumps are not so good, knuckles aren't always that clean. Yeah. The, the, but they, you really want to stay three to six feet from everyone. I've devised a gesture. <laughs> it's elegant, it's friendly, it conveys respect. There's also. Do it from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we, so, we don't want a segment. We want every human being to do this. Yes. There's no brand associated with it, there's no money to be made, but all of us would be better off with the universal adoption of. Yes, yeah, so. The Jerry, it, I'm calling yeah, the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, no brand, but the Jerry. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think, uh, so this is about cultural change, right? This is a, how do we, how do we um, inject a, um, an exogenous shock to the system in such a way that people adopt it and then it begins to propagate. It's the same way everything else propagates, right? Like the, the, the normal curve is the normal curve because that's how everything diffuses in a, in a normal way. So it re requires people who are willing to be silly first and you know, introduce it to the population and then it begins to, to spread out. You know, interestingly enough, this is not unlike smoking, right? So it didn't hit 100% of the population, but you know, 20 years ago, like if you smoked, you just smoked. It was a thing, like you smoked indoors, et cetera, et cetera, until it became um, seen as a social faux pas. Right, they try to tax it, and people are still like, "I just gotta have my smokes, man." But once it was like, "Oh, you smoke? What are you doing?" Or like, "You can't come around here." Or if you want to smoke, you gotta go fifty yards away from the building and like be huddled around like zombies smoking. Right? It became it became um, socially deviant to do a thing, and for handshaking to kind of find its exit, it will require first introducing a alternative, but then culturally the society negotiates and constructs that we think this is no longer suitable, this is now the thing. I mean, it's, it'll be, a great, uh, it'll be a, a great thing for a marketer to do, for sure. You have the patent already on this, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Jerry. Yeah. I find myself, even as someone who knows demographics doesn't make sense, still saying like, oh, how do we attack Gen Z or how do we do yeah. that? So like, what, how do you actually get to that point even just making the shift? I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so easy for us to, to put people in these boxes. We've been doing it our entire life. In fact, our brain is wired to do that very, very efficiently, right? Like I do this all the time. Um, uh, Deborah drives a minivan. Does Deborah have kids? Yeah, Deborah has kids, right? Uh, what kind of sport do your kids play? Soccer, right, right. And where does Deborah live? <laughs> right. I gave you one data point about data you, about Deborah. You mapped out her whole life. That's because the worldview we have of someone who drives a minivan is female. She has to have kids. They live in a cul-de-sac. They play soccer in the whole life, right? That is so ingrained in our wiring. It helps us make sense of the world in a very, very quick way so we don't spend, too, we don't allocate too much brain power on something as frivolous as understanding Deborah. But for marketers, we, under, we know that that is an inaccurate way to view people, at least the population uh, of people. And as, as Jeffrey mentioned, like ethnography has been around for a very long time. It came out of anthropology as a way to understand people by not just walking a mile of their shoes, as we say, but as seeing the world through their lenses by going native. Right? If you want to know about, about cosplayers, hang out with cosplayers for three months, go to Comic-Con, like live the life of a cosplayer, dress up, do the whole thing, and you become empathetic. I mean, this is really all about empathy, feeling the pain of someone else, seeing the world the way they see it. And while ethnographies were the dominant way by which you, you did that, right, going native, the birth of social networking platforms provide an unbelievable um, amount of transparency around people's behaviors and at a far greater scale. So you can be as micro as you want to be and as macro as you want to be as the people that you want to go after. It requires two things, though. One, your, um, your willingness or appetite to get close. And two, like 
an unbelievable curiosity. And I think that that's what makes researchers researchers, that we're constantly curious, like why is that? And it's not about looking for answers, it's about looking for questions. Like the best marketers in the world to me are stand-up comedians. Because they spend their whole lives observing people be like, well, you see that? What was that? <laughs> I just witnessed a phenomenon. I wonder if it happens in the world more often. And I start looking at the phenomenon happen, and then comedians take causality-based theory, apply it to the phenomenon they just saw, then they get on stage and say, have you ever noticed that we do blah, 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 that we all just laugh? Oh my God, I totally do that. Of course you do, right? And good researchers identify that. And what marketers, market, market researchers have to be is that curious and have an appetite to get that close to the network of, of interest. There's this phenomena, naive realism psychologists talk about, where how you take your inputs as real data. And George Carlin, the comedian, basically said, why is it that you ever notice that anyone driving slower than you is this sort of idiot, and everyone driving faster than you is this maniac? And it like, <laughs> completely captures it. Why? I'm just driving the perfect speed all the time. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What's the saying? That um, we judge people by their actions, and we judge ourselves by our intent. Right? And the only way you get an intent is by being intimate, by being close. Like, Asking why beyond the surface level. When you look at something at, at the surface, quick, you know, in, in an economist sort of way, system one, oh, in a judgmental way, this is what's happening. But when you start going a little bit deeper, observing a bit closer, you realize that there's far more under there. There's a far greater undercurrent under there that you realize that you understand, you empathize, you see how they see the world, and you realize you're not the best driver of the world either. Marcus, thank you for being here. Um, kind of similar to her question. kind of a problem, a societal problem that you noticed that most people had noticed and you were able to kind of really dive deeply into that problem and provide a solution? Sure. Um, I think about, I mean, it's not, as, it's not as serious as social issues, but for a client it was. So you know the brand Potbelly? Potbelly is a sandwich shop, right? And, and we met them, they said, hey, you know, we, we have this like cult-like following, people who love the brand. Uh, but we want to, but it's very niche, and we want to kind of expand ourselves by telling better brand stories. Okay, um, so we said, well, what do you believe? Like, what's the ideology of Pop Belly? It's like, we believe in making really good sandwiches. Like, no, that's what you do. Like, why do you do it? What's the belief in a very timeless sort of way? And after like meeting this, the CEO and the, the the founder and whatever, we arrived at the guy was like, man, I make sandwiches for people because I just made them happy and it made me happy making people happy. So I was like, oh, well, you you just happen to sell sandwiches, but you're in the happiness business. That's what you're all about. So the question becomes, so, so who do we talk to? Now, Pop Valley does not have a lot, of, they don't spend a lot of money on marketing communications. Like whatever's in your wallet, it's probably more than they spend on marketing communications. Like it's really it's laughable um, what they do. So whatever we did with them had to be very, very surgical about how we delivered it. So I, did, I asked them, told them, give me the email addresses for like their biggest ravenous fans. And they have this thing called the sandwich board. And they, they send them like uh, coupons, they have them test new product, blah, blah, blah. So they gave me those email addresses and then we put them in a, uh, uh, an application that assigned the email addresses to their Twitter handle. It doesn't exist anymore because of GDRP. But at that time, we were able to find an association between their Twitter handles, their email addresses and their Twitter handles. So once we got the Twitter handles of about 60% of them, we then mapped the network. That is, we looked at the conversations that they have about Potbelly first, and then conversations they have that are sans Potbelly to see what these people had in common beyond just liking sandwiches, right? And what we're able to find is clusters around things that they were sharing. And what we know about network theory is that if we can understand the structure of the network, that is, the typology of the network, and the position that people have inside the network, then we can get a sense of how information flows. Not only how information flows, but also how influence propagates. So we looked at these clusters, and there were four things that raised to the top. The first was um, they were like big sports fans. We were like, okay, maybe we do something in sports. That's interesting. So put that to the side. Then um, we saw that they were like really big into like Martech and like marketing uh, technology. We were like, uh, I don't know if we could do with that. Then there like people. They were like they were like happy go lucky Christians. They're like like Joel Olstein like Christians. Like, well, that's interesting. But the client would never do anything with that, so let's move it away. But then we saw that people were talk were like really into music. And at first glance, we were like. Everyone loves music. No one hates music. Only monsters hate music. Um, but like, let's look a little bit closer. And we saw that they were sharing disproportionate to Twitter 
tons of SoundCloud files. Now, what we know of SoundCloud is SoundCloud is itty bitty relative to Spotify or YouTube from music. Not only that, but the artists that are on SoundCloud are unsigned artists. They're not like Beyonce's of the world. They're like Pookie down the street, right? So the idea was that these people are really close to the bleeding edge of music. And considering the fact that Potbelly has live musicians in their shop during lunch, we're like, that's the angle in. We're going to leverage music as a way to make people happy. So we came up with all these ideas. We put in front of the client. The client said, I like them all. Let's go test them. And I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in self-reported data. So I was like, well, let's not do that. Let's try something different. So uh, we worked with a lab to do psychophysiological testing. And that is we put people in front of the content we wanted to put in the world, and we hooked them up to biometrics that identified their sweat gland release, their eye tracking, their um, respiratory uh, response, their zygomatic muscle, which is the smile, to find the content that made people the most happy. And the ones that registered the happiest, that's what we put in the world. I have a follow-up. Please. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. With this example, right, I'm really already Yep. To do this. How, do you, how do you make something like that happen without having that amount of data? So, I mean, every, every problem is different, right? So we luckily had that that we were able to, to, uh, to tap into, but there, there's conversations already existed, right? We just had an easy starting point. I think if we didn't have those email addresses, we would look at people who talk about Potbelly and see what those people have in common. We just take the, the broader the broader population of people who mentioned Potbelly, then we would have taken those Twitter handles and then would assess the network of those people. And I imagine we probably find something similar. Mm. I imagine because of uh, because of how dense those clusters was, we actually went after. From what I hear from you and some of the things that we talked about with impact and sort of just design more generally, is you need to have a much more diverse set of tools. You can't just rely on big data analytics. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people already are very attracted to those for good reasons, but that doesn't mean you should ignore the qualitative, the small sample, extreme samples. 100%. You need sort of this more portfolio. Is that? Absolutely. I don't know if this is exactly where you're going, but... Um, but I, mean, and I think this is the folly, is that because we have more technology, we then kind of poo-poo what was more somewhat manual, right? More intimate, if you will. Because we have more data, we tend to like look at the data. What does the data say? But the data doesn't have an opinion. Right? The data is just an observation of what happened. And it's your job to extract insight from said data. But if you don't know the beliefs those people hold, the meaning that's in those artifacts, the behaviors that are known in the language that they use, you don't understand the cultural characteristics, then you can't, sus you can't suss out meaning from the data that exists, which is problematic. Also, if we're relying on the tools, if you don't know the, uh, the, the, what's informing the tools, then it doesn't matter anyway. And all of it's based off of mm -hmm. like hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, qualitative research. So in the case of, I would argue, again, that the benefit of, of, um, of social good-driven um, entities is that if we're relieving points of friction, man, People do not hold back when it comes to, I want to say complaining, it comes to self-reporting the issues that they have. Mm. And these become signals on like, this is, these things we can solve. Not only does it inform innovation, the, the things that we invent, but it also lets us know where we should be and the people who are mm. experiencing the most pain. So if this were, you know, in the case of something that was like a social cause Thing, not like a commercial entity, I will look at all the people who have used language relative to the problem that, that our idea solves. And then I would map that network. What do these people have in common beyond the problem? That is, why is this an issue? Whether it's informed because of cultural drivers, whether it's informed because of, uh, of uh, governmental drivers, like what are the things that are informing this stuff so it can inform, not, it can, so it can help us optimize not only the product service, but also the way in which we communicate it. I think it's sort of interesting when you ask this question about you know data and, and empathy and perspective taking. Um, it's it's sort of seen now the, the zeitgeist people talk about empathy is important, perspective taking is is important. One of the stories um, that I like to share about how actually this is quite difficult is the story of Walt Disney. So you've probably been to Disneyland, the real one in California. 
<laughs> and uh, basically, Walt was obsessed with trying to take the perspective of a child. Yeah. And really, the moral of the story is that why would he have to work so hard? Because he presumably was a child at one point. If he had to work this hard to take a perspective he already had, yeah. how much harder is it to get a perspective of someone we've never been? That's right. Um, and so this idea of trying to do this deep dive, this empathy, is critical. And actually for social problems, so if we think about, say, some of the, the goals from the UN Sustainable Development Goals, anthropologists are often discouraged from trying to study their own culture mm -hmm. during training because it's just too difficult. Like fish don't know they're in water. Uh, and so you go somewhere else. Given that we're in society, it's actually really hard to try to gain a perspective of someone who may live next door That's right. or who, who's on the street or, or what not. And so um, what are some of your thoughts then about how – how you can sort of tackle some of these issues of, of gaining a, a true perspective. So there was a, there is this experience where you send bankers around town to try to accomplish basic financial tasks like cashing a check and so forth. Yeah. And they're often just shocked, like, wow, it's really hard to, to, uh, to use my business <laughs> in banking. <laughs> like, wow, it never occurred to them. Yeah. And they're so close to this. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of social impact issues, I, I feel, are, are like this also. It's just... I had no idea that people only got paid once a month or yeah. that coupons only come out on the third. Right. Um, are there sort of things, uh, tools, perspectives that you've worked on that you think are particularly helpful or powerful for getting that really deep uh, insight about others? I think this is why diversity matters. Diversity not just of representation, but diversity of perspective, different walks of life. To say, hey man, that's not how it is when I, where I come from. Right? And having the diverse backgrounds allows us to look at problems like a Picasso. Right, from different angles, they show you a different, a different representation. I think that you know, it requires, A, having the people there with diverse perspectives, but also have a culture within the organization that allows for it, that enables them, empowers them to mm. be deviant, to say, mm, I don't think that's a thing. Um, and the interesting part about all this is that it seems so lo-fi to answer that question with that, as opposed to, here's a tool that does blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right? It's like we, we rely so much on the technology as opposed to the thing that informs the technology, which is people. I, you, you had mentioned this when you were in the Impact Studio, and I'm blown away by this. So you know, imagine, not imagine, but the teams are comprised of folks from School of Information, from social work, MBAs, are coming at this from completely different angles, yeah. um, have healthy arguments and debates on it. Um, and every time you just learn something new, it's just, you know, I never thought of this. Yeah. Um, today, someone used the term, well, non-traditional student. And the social work students like, that's offensive. And the, <laughs> and the MBA is like, what? How is this possible? And so then we sort of unpacked all of this. Um, I think you're spot on. So yes. Yeah. From diversity from that. Other questions? Can you speak to your thought process behind experimental design? Because like, you had a sandwich shop like you were looking at Twitter. Or this person wanted to test your music theory in vivo, but you decided to go to, to a lab. Like, yeah. How do you think through this process of, of designing this experiment? So the question is about experimental design to get at, uh, get at I guess, richer evidence. Agriculture, what campaign would be most successful? Yeah, so, you know, so I, I think that uh, clearly I'm a critic of, of, of advertising and marketing. You know, I think that the ways in which marketers have historically gone about the practice is antiquated. And it's sort of like, it reminds me of like my car stereo when I was in college. Like I didn't have a CD changer, I wasn't balling like that. Um, I had my, my, disc, my, my, my cassette player, but then I had a CD player with the aux cord, with the tape that went in, right? So I bolted on the technology to something that already existed, right? And I think that marketing advertising is very similar in that way. We never really upgrade our perspective, we just bolt on new technology and hope that it'll work, at least allows us to create the veneer so as I look at problems, I don't think of problems as a marketer, so to say, or as an advertiser. I think about it from a scholarly perspective. I'm like, you know, I'm always like, what would Dan Ariely do? Because <laughs> I'm a huge Dan Ariely fan. I always think about like, how do we best get at the truth? And it's really about understanding truth. Now, truth is not objective. Like, I, you know, I, I, I believe the world is culturally and socially constructed, right? But what is the truth for these people? relative to the brand and what are best ways to get at that. And typically, I try to be as deviant as possible. So soon as someone comes to me and says, oh, I found all of this, um, I found all the, this research in you know, whatever survey, immediately my first thought is to reject it. To be like, mm, show me something secondary that supports that. 
and that that kind of muscle memory to reject the status quo i think opens me up to try more creative ways to get at the truth good would you have any suggestions for how to bring that to the workplace because i'm totally on board for this dvnc yeah um but then when you um i personally work really independently as the only marketer within my much elderly team yeah <laughs> yeah and so how would i working in a team like this kind of market to them the value of this approach mm -hmm. rather than tried and true data and, and to be clear by elderly you mean at what age like you know? way over 50. <laughs> um, way over yeah way, way over way over 50. i mean i like what you said how do you market to them this idea about marketing because it really is that i mean look Marketing is about influencing behavior, right? And this is ultimately what you're doing. And I would say you do this the same way you would be marketing to a population of people you want to consume or to move. It's like you got to preach the gospel. And you're not going to convince everybody. Just like we talked about before, this isn't about the funnel, blasphemy people to try to get a few. Start the people who are most inclined to move, right? If you look at the, the research done by Duncan Watts, who's, um, uh, who studies uh, influence, he talks a lot about influence happens when easily influenced people are influence other easily influenced people, right? Influence, um, influenceable people. And the notion is the same thing here. Find the people who are probably most likely to adopt the behavior, get them on board, and then they become another kind of mouthpiece for you. And you slowly but surely go knock door to door to start convincing the population. And before long, as we talked about with this cascading model, is that the, the cultural norm is that we believe marketing as such and people who are on the outskirts will fall in line just to promote social solidarity. Sure. It's, 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 a, it's, it's not an easy thing. I don't mean to say that like, in like just do that, yeah. done. Right? Yeah. It's, it, takes a lot, it takes a lot of effort and oftentimes hmm. it's not easily accomplished, especially the bigger the organization, the harder, the harder it is because you've got to convince more, more people. There was a study that came out in Science probably like the last 12 or 18 months, that try to understand mathematically where's this tipping point. Yeah. I think 20%, something like this, where you can get a group's norms to completely change. That's right. So if you think of, if you have 10 people in your organization, you're one of that. If, how many more do you need if it's just 20%, trying to get them on board. Right. Uh, and then you can convert the right. others. It's the so. diffusion. As soon as you cross the chasm, you've got some yeah. momentum happening. Right. Yeah. But it, take, it, it takes time, it takes consistency, and it takes a lot of like relentlessness of you to be willing to push. And oftentimes people are like, man, I'm done with this. And they go somewhere else, which is interesting because like you go, you end up finding yourselves in jobs or in organizations that are most akin to how you see the world, right? You go, you find ourselves happy when we're doing the work that we like to do with people who are like ourselves, right? There's, there's, there's this homophily that happens with people who see the world similarly. You feel like, oh, I just so fit into the culture. Or, and when the culture is so salient, we call it a cult-like organization because the culture is, it's, it's, it's very tangible. And ultimately what you're doing is trying to push the culture forward. Repeat customers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Favorite brand? Jerry's. Jer Jerry's gestures. Jerry's. <laughs> Jerry's gestures. That's amazing. You just like alliteration. Jerry's gestures. I do, I do. I'm a marketer. What do you do? That's great. Um, my favorite brand right now. My favorite brand. So I, I would have to say by default Yeezys. Like I love Kanye West. I have a complicated relationship with Kanye West. There you go. Um, but you know, so the research I'm doing right now, so I'm studying um, the mechanisms of social propagation uh, within cultures of consumption, particularly hip hop culture. So I'm looking at how do brands become, how do, how do people negotiate what brand is in, what brand is out, construct meaning around it, and then it propagates within, within the population. Um, and what I found with, so I'm looking at like, like 12 brands that I'm looking at right now, and Yeezys are one of them. And I find it fascinating how the namesake of Yeezy can be so polarizing. People be like, I'm done with him, I'm not listening to his music, blah, 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 blah. His music is objectively not as good as it used to be. Facts, right? Um, but yet, the product has become a part of the cultural uh, silhouette of footwear, 
right? Not only is the sneaker the most valuable sneaker in the market, it is the sneaker that most people copy, right? The sock like, the sock with a sole is basically what Yeezy created back in what, 2016 when Yeezy jumped over Jumpman, right? And I think it's fascinating to see how people construct meaning around them and be able to separate their affinity to Kanye West and try to think about things like, you know, they're just so comfortable on my feet. It's like, come on, son. <laughs> but, come on. Um, and it, 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 the, the, um, the negotiation process to me is just fascinating. Um, so I love the brand for that matter. But not only that, I'm a hip hop fan, so there's that connection. But also just in December, I was teaching in Dubai with some Saudis, right? I think about Saudis being, you know, they, they, they have the, the, cli- oh. the clique on their dog. You, you think of it being conservative, right? But then they sit down and we're about to start class, and I'm like, yo, fam, hold up, time out. You got all Yeezys. What's that being here? Like, literally, like 20% of the people there were wearing Yeezys. It's just phenomenal to me um, to see that sort of cultural prop- propagation. So, right now, it's my favorite brand. It's because I'm in the research right now, but yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think. The question. The question. Oh, sorry. Um, the pink. The question was which brands that I admire that take a good time of understanding the people and putting products in the world that are analogous to, to people. So I, you know, for me, I think that Patagonia is just like just bar none. They're just the best at this um, because you know Patagonia does what I try to tell my clients to do is that before you start thinking about who we're going to go after and what products we put in the market, start with what do you believe? Ideologically, how do you see the world? Because the way you see the world is going to inform the way you behave in the world, the way you communicate, the products you put in the world, who you partner with, where you show up, like all these things are going to be informed by this North Star that you have identified for yourself. And Patagonia, from the founder, was like, this is what we believe, right? I believe in climbing clean, right? It's less invasive on the earth, and it's safer for everybody else, he started with creating rivets or whatever you use to climb mountains. I don't climb mountains, right? Whatever that thing is, he started with that. It's like, I can also create all these other products. So it doesn't matter what products that Patagonia puts in the market as long as it aligns to the belief system. And people who subscribe to the brand's belief system will pay a premium for Patagucci. Is it warmer than North Face? I don't know, right? Does it keep you more snugly than Columbia? Maybe, right? But having that mark, that that mark is consecrated, right? And the brand even goes as much as say, don't buy our product. In fact, you should just repair it because it's, they will forego revenue for them, forego margin for them in an effort to live up to their brand ideology. Like that is just phenomenal. So um, since you brought up coats, uh, there are schools that ban Canadian goose <laughs> because of uh, how it makes it, uh, it's a troublemaker for stratified, so, socioeconomically stratified sure. schools. Sure. Um, uh, nothing against if anyone's wearing Canadian goose yeah. uh, or knuckles, but uh, as sort of terms of like, well, maybe it's not alleviating poverty by not allowing people to wear Canadian goose, but in yeah. terms of thinking about the culture and and creating a more harmonious society and so forth. Yep. What's what's your take on um, that issue and and the brand's role in um, highlighting? Income disparities. Well, I think mean, not a U of M because everyone's rich. Totally. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's true. Remember, we came, moved to New York. I was gonna. Um, my wife was pregnant before this, the winter before we moved here, and it's like I'm gonna buy her a coat. Like you know, it'd be my, my Christmas gift to her. I saw all the kids wearing the red and white. I was like, that double winter buy that for her. And I went to check the website, and it was like a grand. It's like you be cold this winter, baby. It ain't happening, <laughs> right? So, so what you're getting at, to me at least, is you know, it's. It's sort of questioning the idea of consumption at its core, right? Like, you know, so Jean Piaget, who's, uh, not Jean Piaget, but uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who was very famed sociologist, talked about this idea of cultural capital, right? And the things that we consume signal the amount of cultural capital that we have. There is embodied cultural capital, it is the products that we have, right? They communicate something about our their social rankings, right? And our ability to have economic capital gets us cultural capital. That cultural capital puts us in in stratospheres with other people like ourselves, which only provide more opportunity for economic capital. 
There's institutionalized cultural capital, which is why we're all at a school like University of Michigan, Ross School of Business, because it signals something about ourselves. It puts us in networks of people that gives us access to more economic capital. And then there is institutionalized cultural capital. I mean, there's, um, there's, oh, sorry, there is uh, objectified cultural capital, which is the brand. There's embodied cultural capital, which is like the skills that we have, that is language, our ability to play piano, accent, things of nature. I mean, all of these things are signaling something about where we are on the, the, the social hierarchy. And if you start to mitigate that by removing brands that are, are, that are available, then you start to kind of eat at what consumption really provides. You know, we talk a lot about like the Industrial Revolution being like the big sort of Big Bang Theory for, for consumption, right? But that one talks about the supply side. The demand side has always been there, that we've always adorned ourselves, even in the Elizabethan days, hmm. um, that like noblemen dress this way to say where you are and the, the social status. So yeah. I think removing, removing brands that signal socioeconomic status, which is a part of the, the social yeah. hierarchy, only starts to erode at the idea of consumption at its core. And where does, yeah. the idea is then where does it stop? And this was, so this was a policy put in by schools. And you know, PETA had the campaign, or and there was a campaign of throwing paint on people yeah. wearing animals and stuff. Um, not saying that, but do you know any other examples where campaigns uh, were specifically trying to dilute the influence of a brand? Oh, yeah. I mean, we talked about smoking, per- the truth campaign. Okay. Right, the first big truth activation is when they um, they they had Green Canadian goose geese uh, goose <laughs> is like smoking. Is, right. what you, is what you said. Just the, for I, the, no, the, <laughs> the idea is that you know they took um, they got twelve hundred body bags and they threw them all outside out in front of um, uh, I think it was um, Marbles um, their, um, their 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 headquarters. To be like, this is the truth, right? Which begins to start to erode our, the, the, the cultural appetite of smoking, kind of this, the start of that. Um, and the same thing kind of, kind of goes here. These are, PETA was saying, you know, you run the risk of getting paint thrown on your fur if you mm. do this. I guess if you gave everybody fake or real Canadian goose badges and put them on every jacket, it's not a difference here. But, so, but this is the interesting Wait, part about fraud. This interesting part about the secondary market is that the secondary market, i.e. knockoffs and fakes, provide democratization to that sort of flossing. Right? Like just as much as you go to Canada Goose official site or its, its outlets, retailers, to buy the official thing, you get the knockoff and not really able to tell the difference. Okay, I won't keep going down my, <laughs> where we've been in yeah. certain parts of the world where you can get them more easily. Yeah. Another question. Yes. Hi, thanks for coming. I was really wondering about if you had an experience with a brand that just like went through a scandal and if you had to do some like remarketing campaigns and how do you make it effective for products like that? Scandal. So, you know, I'm, I wish I had an example where, um, where we turned the corner and everything was great. Uh, but I did have a brand that had a pretty big scandal um, and did nothing about it. So uh, State Farm's client was a client of mine for four years. Um, and right around the time when Trayvon Martin was murdered, um, it came out that the Stand Your Ground Act, which Zimmerman used as a defense, was supported by ALEC, the lobbyist group. And then all the brands who had funded ALEC came out in the public, and State Farm was one of them. And brands like Delta and Coca-Cola were like, we're pulling the plug. We're not going to rock with them anymore. And when we asked State Farm, like, hey, what are you going to do? Like, we'll get the, the post together. What do you want us to say? What do you want us to do? They're like, nothing. No. You're going to keep quiet about it. And people were like dropping like flies. Like, I'm, I'm, um, I'm no longer going to be um, a State Farm customer because of this thing. This is like a really big backlash. And as an organization, they decided to do nothing which to me was just infuriating. I was really upset, so much so that while State Farm paid the bills for me in in the agency, I was like, look, there's no way I'm gonna have the service. So at the very least, I now have Geico. But that was a situation where the brand decided to do nothing, which I thought was really irresponsible. Hey, Hey Marcus, thanks for being here. What's happening, Joey? Um, So a bit of an open-ended question, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on so, I mean, considering what's going on with, like, digital technology, like, half my interviews this past year, and I'm sure a lot of people that are in school here were, like, going on blue jeans and Zoom, right? Yeah. So that's already been happening. 
obviously pair that what's going on with the world today with COVID-19, like the acceleration of just, you know, going virtual and how that's going to change the interaction of how, of how sellers talk to their buyers. Yeah. Whether that's you with your clients or whether that's Clorox trying to sell to the retail or whatever it might be, like what are your general thoughts on how this is all going to be impacted in the next, you know, few years to come and how we go direct to consumer or whatever that look, might look yeah. like. So the impact on digital when it comes to our exchanges with people, whether it's exchanges and interviews or buyers or sellers, et cetera. You know, I think about, I, um, my, my take on digital is that digital is extension of what we've always done, right? Very Marshall McLuhan kind of point of view there, that technology only extends on human behavior. Marshall McLuhan would argue that, you know, that the, the wheel is extension of the foot, glass extensions of the eyes, clothes extensions of the skin, cameras extensions of our memory, Right, computer extensions of the brain, taking syntax and turning into if-then statements. And I believe that digital does the exact same thing. It takes um, the, the behaviors that we already do and it allows us, to, allows us to extend them thanks to the zeros and ones. And you know, the funny part about the digital world is that we think about digital as like the real world and the digital are completely, completely different. But like bloggers who spend their career behind a computer screen every year go to a blogger conference. So they can look at people in front of the face like, oh man, oh my god, just give me a hug, I know it. There's the, 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 the in-person human connection is, I would argue, it can't be replicated. But what the zeros and ones provide us is a way to extend <coughs> what normally would be more, more, um, more cost burdensome, um, but it allows us to stay connected Far longer, it reduces what will be normal decay in our in our interactions with people. Like there's so much benefit to it, and it allows us to meet more people. So if I'm interviewing people and I can't fly everybody out to Houston and see them in Houston, I can interview a lot of people and then whittle it down to people I like the most, and then have those few people fly out. So it enables me to do more of what I've already done. I would say. Yep. products and things and like one of the objectives of the talk is social impact which is a lot harder potentially less sexy and just like I'm still grappling with like how do we how do we take all the awesome things that you're teaching and that we're learning about and sort of like connect it to things that are harder to adopt and can represent inconvenience and I mean I think this is not a fully formed and problematic example but like there are celebrities that live like very low impact lifestyles that they're very public about and it still doesn't seem to hold that same value as like, well, I'd rather drive the car that they drive rather than adopt sure. sort of like the lower impact lifestyle yeah. that they see what I'm I wonder yeah, no the spot on that's um, exactly you, I wonder more. if you might want to talk a little bit about the one of the students groups in the impact studio was really trying to tackle these you could these vulnerable populations who don't have access to social capital, like we do at the University of Michigan, who may go to a career school, say a Washtenaw Community College or, a, or an EMU, yeah. and their idea was trying to match people who have resources and expertise with these kids. And th that's their idea, but they're trying to figure out the mechanics of it. And so you, yeah. you came in with, and they had some ideas, and yeah. you were trying to help them by applying some of this. So it might right. be... So, I mean, so that's, that's sort of, that is... Um, the idea is to take, take what's worked for LeBron James and apply it to the person who's learned to play basketball, right? And we typically think about there's, you know, there is uh, social impact marketing and then there's like brand consumer marketing. It's completely different. But the fundamentals are very much the same. And what happens is that marketers like myself typically don't go into social impact because the dollars aren't as long, the money isn't as big, it's much more sexier to do this sort of thing, which is one of the reasons why I'm sitting here, to like take those learnings and apply them to this, right? So this, and the important part, if I live up with anything, is that who, what we're really doing is trying to get people to move. Like that, that, is, that is the job. Whether it's to get people to do something like mentor people in their neighborhoods, or people to cop the newest Yeezys. It, we still have to overcome the same, same cultural barriers, the same psychological barriers, the same social barriers um, that, that exist, right? Because, you know, neuro neurologically, we're all the same, give or take a few neurons or so. 
<clears throat> so the, the idea here is how do we take concepts that we know have worked in the commercial world and apply them to the social impact world? So with this team in particular, we were talking about jobs to be done, right? So Clay Christensen, rest in peace, you know, had this really, really powerful um, provocation is that people don't buy products and brands, they hire products and brands to get a job done, right? And then the thing about the jobs we've done is like three different kind of jobs. There is the functional job, that is, I need to you know, brush my teeth, bring my teeth clean, what toothpaste should I buy? There is the emotional job, I wanna feel a certain way about myself doing it, and then there is the social job, I want people to see me a certain way. And the same, thing we, the same way we buy products, branded products, are the same way that we make decisions across all of our consumption patterns. You know, I used to work with, um, with the, the big brother, big sister of Washtenaw County, and I would talk to them and say like, listen, let's pause for a moment and talk about your <clears throat> business relative to reality. Like you are, there's a marketplace, right? The job to be done for people who go and mentor may be I wanna dose of serotonin, I wanna feel good about myself. And for big brother, big sister, big boys and girls club, no, big brother, big sister, excuse me, those. Big, uh, big brother, big sister, it's a year long commitment. Like it has to be a year long because of what the research says as far as making impact on, on the kids. If you think about that in the marketplace perspective, that's a really expensive investment where I can go to the neutral zone and volunteer for an hour and feel just as good about myself, right? Which means that we have to find different ways to help people get that job done when the premium is more expensive. So while that organization wouldn't have thought about themselves in a marketplace scenario like a State Farm or a Yeezy would, it's the exact same parallels that we have to take those learnings and apply them to here. And one of the reasons why I'm in academia is not only to help empower you guys to make those changes, but to also get closer to those organizations to leverage that thinking for this. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, curious about like when brands try to execute on a social impact mission, right? Yeah. Ultimately, you're still trying to sell whatever it is. How do you help them do it authentically and make sure that comes across you know, in a really organic way to it? Yeah, so we know these brands aren't philanthropies, right? They're in it to make some money. Um, and they make, a, you know, they, they, they take on kinetics that seem to be outside of transaction, outside of commerce. And the idea is that those brands get, they, they get permission to do so when they align to their ideology, right? When they align to how they see the world. For instance, um, I think about REI. Are you familiar with REI? So REI, outdoor retailer who decided to close their doors on Black Fridays because they, th they believe that a life well spends life spent outdoors. And they looked at themselves and said, if we believe that life well spends life spent outdoors, then how in the world are we asking people to come where most people have the day off to come inside and shop? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's like, well, we make a lot of money. We go from the, from the red to the black doing Black Friday. That's why we do it. But if we really believe that life well spends life spent outdoors, then we need to be telling people to go out and play. So that's what they did. They closed their doors, 2016, I think. Closed their doors and paid their employees to go out and play, right? Shut off their commerce on Black Friday to live out what they believe. The impact of that though actually resulted in their best weekend Black Friday sales they've ever had, right? Ever, they've never had this kind of, this kind of uh, benefit before. Uh, CVS, the exact same way. CVS said, we're all about preventative, preventative health. health. And it's like, well, if that's the case, then how do we sell tobacco products in our, in our stores? So they said that we need to end that, which was at the tune of $2 billion of revenue, but they stopped selling it and actually made more money by doing minute clinics, actually helping people. So they, they tell people about that? Like, what are you guys saying? Like, hey, we're shutting down on Friday. Oh, yeah, they totally. They, they they did a whole campaign called Opt Outside. And the beautiful part about this is that they inspired other companies to do the exact same thing. Not just that, but national parks started to open up their parks when they normally would be closed, providing free entry for people to go outside and play. Right? This is the idea of the network effect. You activate the people who see the world the most most congruently way that you do, and then it begins to, to propagate. Yep. But I guess one could argue that in that example that they probably still tested that theory and kind of knew that they were going to benefit from it, which is why they did it. Maybe. I don't know. So I, I can't, this, I can't, um, I can't evaluate intent right. because I wasn't in the room. Right. I just, it's, I, at the very least, I could just assume maybe. Mm. But it's interesting, so it's a, who knows about that, yeah. but it is interesting that even if they had sort of the secret plan, if you get these cascading effects, yeah. then 
that's sort of an interesting um, and, game. But it, and I suppose yeah. that, I mean that's that's the learning though, right? Like whether it was malicious, whether it was like you know we know it was going to work anyway. The idea is that the design of activating the network gets people to move, mm. and for people like yourselves who want to have social impact, to do some good in the world, leverage that mm. those learnings, those those skills to to get people to move. Sir. Yeah, um, we don't see a cross-cultural advertising, marketing, branding. So we don't see advertisements from, say, uh, Sweden or India or Japan. But we do see, I do see, um, advertisements from Canada. We're so close to Canada, we get Canadian TV. Yeah. And I am amazed. On Canadian television, their marketing and branding and advertising is all about humor. Some of it's sort of subtle and cute and funny, and other uh, advertising for different companies is like outrageous and over the top, yeah. hilarious. And I, I, I wondered how that plays out the, if you wanted to speak about other countries and how they think different or the cultural aspect of that mm. country, how it changes branding and marketing and what in the heck is going on with these Canadians? Because it's <laughs> almost, uh, and I mean almost every Canadian advertisement uses humor. Well, there's a level of, of tonality that matches the disposition of the people. And we talk about the people, you know, in the United States there's 320 million people. Like not all of them are the same, just like, you know, we're not all homogeneous, just like they're, they're in Canada. But I imagine that because of over time, um, that that has become the norm. That has become the expected norm of advertising and therefore it probably um, goes over well. Unlike in the States. So if you look in Europe, for instance, Italy is a good example, Rome, Paris the same way, like they do a lot of risque advertising that like here in the States, we'd be like, oh, I'm grabbing my pearls. What am I looking at here, right? Um, because what is considered normal, that is culturally normative, are not the same in different places. So for marketers who want to go international, right, into different cultures, we have to, we ha we have to be able to amend the marketing communication relative to the shared beliefs, the social norms, the, the artifacts and language of those particular people. I need to look at more Canadian ads, though. No. I'm, curious. I'm intrigued. <laughs> well, actually, your point really raises this issue with, with thinking about social impact issues. One, you might have issues on some, some that's working very well in the United States and you're trying to take it global. How would that go viral? Or there are subcultures within the United States, and so you can't assume that the way in which you'd package this would necessarily um, appeal more broadly. Absolutely. I mean, part of, I think, the real value you had for uh, the teams and the, in the mini session that you gave was to say, all right, we want to make social impact. We can identify really important issues. We can leverage some research or expertise to address it. But fundamentally, we're going to need this thing to, to take on. We're going to need to convince people, uh, supporters or businesses, to, to sort of get involved with this. Right. Better to have the conversations as you're developing the idea rather than at the end. Exactly. And so um, maybe I'm deviating a little bit from the subculture component, but can you speak to the misconception that thinking about micro, micro, uh, marketing as sort of something you do after it's created uh, it's, to how can we think about that while creating it, co-creating that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're putting things in the world to get people to move. And if we're not thinking about people in the early stages of it, then how are we ever going to accurately get them to move, right? So even to the question about understanding that these people like humor, these people don't, these people like seriousness, these people don't. It's real random. <laughs> like, so we're all gonna just act like this didn't just happen right now? I think, like, this chord matters. I think someone gave a talk and swiped our food on the way out. <laughs> it's like, and I'm taking some shrimp. Um, so culture matters, right? And if our job is to move people, then we can't think about the people after the thing is done. Right? I think a lot about innovation as Invention meets value, right? When invention, the thing that we create, meets value, then we find ourselves having the skill of innovation. But the thing about value is that we don't, we don't make value. People ascribe value to the things that, that we do, right? And if you don't understand what people value, i.e. their job to be done, the emotional job, the social job, the functional job, and the cultural drivers that inform those things, then how are you ever going to create something that at least predictably will have an impact? Right? So we have to start with people, especially think about social impact. Social impact is about the impact that, people, that we have on people. And if we, people aren't at the center of this thing, not the problem, but the people, 
that experience the problem, which I think is a, a very important nuance, then the, the solutions that we come up with aren't going to be as politically impactful as we'd like. Um, that's a good point. Yep. And, the re- and the reason why I ask this, I'll give you a little bit more context. Um, I don't necessarily see like a startup company, say me and a few other people in this room, startup company, say hey, we want to, you know, have some sort of company that has some sort of mission that says we're going to have a great, a big social impact for this thing. Yep. Right. And that like take the world by storm. I feel like you need to kind of have partnerships with like sure. brands to yep. really kind of get that audience captivated long enough to actually say, hey. Yeah, you like this brand, but by the way, this is who we're partnering with, this is what they do, and this is what it is. And I'll give you an example. So there's this company in California called Diff. Have you ever heard of it? Mm-hmm. I work um, company. I'm actually wearing some now, but they're they're kind of they're priced way higher than they probably should be. So people pay a premium for them. Um, I got these on sale. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the whole idea is that you buy a pair of glasses, it's kinda of like the concept of Tom's. Tom's, yeah. You buy a pair of glasses and they donate a pair to someone and you can Right. Um, now, say it's a very, very small company. I would argue you know, it's been in business for two, three, maybe four years, maybe longer, I'm not sure. But if they were to partner with, say, Raven, or like, sure. uh, excuse me, not Raven, but like, a, let's say, an outdoors, like, surfing company or something like that, like yep. in California, that has a huge following. Yep. But they have this mission that's different from, you know, maybe, or similar, let's say, to maybe a larger brand. What do you think, like, how do you think that kind of like interplays? It can't just be necessarily like, you know, a few people. Starting off, although it could and grow into something, yeah. but I feel like the larger brands and the larger companies have a much bigger role to play in and that seat at the table of it. Absolutely. It has to be more than just their, like their CSR, right? Like it's, so th- this, this speaks to the research that I talked about earlier, this idea of, of cultural contagion, cultural propagation. Um, it's the notion of compliments and that there are, there are marketplace conditions that we can't control we can't predict, but we can't exploit by finding other people in the market who would benefit from our idea winning. And that is, they see the world the way we do, They're, they subscribe to the same ideology, we wanna do this thing, they're on board too, like let's do it together. And out of this we get compliments, right? And the compliments allow us to have a much, much more powerful impact because we're borrowing from someone else's equity. I think about, um, uh, MX Small Business Saturday is a really good example of this, right? Taking the equity of, of Amex to empower small business owners with all the resources that Amex can provide so that people can drum up more traffic, more, or more, more business on that day. That's a really, really powerful thing. We see this happen all the time in the commercial world. When there's a new Star Wars movie, there is the serial, there's the action figures, there's the, um, the video games, right? There's the merchandise, all of these things. They are all working as compliments to help Star Wars win. Because if Star Wars wins, they win, right? And this idea of going at it alone, I think, is a folly. If we can find other people in the market who see the world the way we do, be it big, small, at the same level or not, then the combined efforts will probably be more powerful. And when we looked, so the research that, that we did way back when is we looked at some of the biggest cultural happenings to get a sense of what was consistent in each one of them, right? Some qualitative research. And we looked at the, the conditions in each one of those cultural happenings over a 20-year period. So we looked at 1995 to 2015. And the notion is that we could find some consistency in these things that maybe perhaps we can like uh, reverse engineer some things that are culturally contagious. And we found was five conditions. Right. In the research, we found that at first it was the content, the idea, and the idea was built to share. That is, it wasn't share a bowl, it was share worthy. And it's a, it's a big difference. We think about how do we make it shareable? How do we make it small, snack size, right? bite size? But there's tons of six second things that we don't share. It's not about it being shareable, it's about it being share worthy. Is it worthy of sharing? The second is that um, it was shared by the appropriate messenger, someone that we trust. Right, so if Jeffrey's like, you gotta check out this new restaurant in Ann Arbor, it's amazing, I'm more inclined to trust it than watching an ad on on television because I trust him. And therefore, the equity and trust that I have with Jeffrey 
transfers to party C, and now I end up giving it a shot. So we saw that there was the idea was built to share, and it was shared by someone that we trusted. The third is that the idea was built with, um, with derivative works. We call them covers, right? That is, you could communicate the idea in unique ways without degradating the integrity of the idea. Think about like music covers, right? If you hear, um, if you hear um, Roberta Flack sing Killing Me Softly, and then you hear Lauren Hill, the Fuji scene, Killing Me Softly, you know it's the same song, even though it's a different arrangement. And the beautiful part about that is that the different arrangement, that is the different expression of the idea, brings more people into the idea. This is why memes are so powerful, right? It's the core idea, but derivative works, which brings more people into the idea. So the content was shareworthy. Um, it was shared by someone with trust, someone with credence. We had covers, thematic iteration. The fourth, which is what you were getting at, is compliments that people weren't going at it alone. There were other people who benefited from the idea succeeding. And the last, which I think is the most powerful, is this notion of concurrence. That is perceived ubiquity of the idea. That everybody's talking about it. Because when everybody's talking about it, we're inclined to do it, right? Everyone's talking about, great example. You guys know the show You on Netflix? Right, so I didn't know anything about it. And in fact, the way it was described to me was just horrible. It was like, it's a guy who stalks girls. <laughs> no, thank you. But then they were like, the girls were like, he can so stalk me any day. He's fine. <laughs> Crazy. Right? But everybody was talking about this show. So I watched it because I heard it from five different people. I'm watching The Bachelor this season because eight people told me about The Bachelor. It's ridiculous. Right? But this is the thing, that there's no such thing as everybody. Like the biggest media moment in the country, only a third of the country watch. Super Bowl. Everybody doesn't exist. The idea of everybody is feigned. However, you can design that it seems like everybody. I wake up in the morning, I check Twitter, people are talking about LeBron James. I go to Starbucks, people talk about LeBron James. I go to class, people talk about LeBron James. I'm on my way to, 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 uh, to my, my car, hear people talk about LeBron James. I go home and say, babe, everybody's talking about LeBron James. It's five people, right? Designing for concurrence, make it seem like everyone's doing it. And as a result, we do it also. So compliments is a part of this thing. And the notion is that if we can take these drivers, these conditions that the alchemy of which help increase the likelihood of cultural propagation, then we can use it to get people to move, whether it's about a commercial enterprise or social impact. I don't know if he was a plant, but you basically just covered your book, your, your research, everything, yeah, all it. Well done. I mean, he got there. I was like, let's just do it, man. Done. Well, well played on that. <laughs> That. We're talking about culture. Yeah. And, you know, you got to partner. I feel like you have to partner with the right folks. Who see the world the way you do. Absolutely. Who see the world the way you do. Yeah. And that's, the, that's your, the messenger part. Exactly. Yeah. Credence. Hiya. So we, we, had, we had a question about random sentences. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about leveraging social impact and kind of using that for their benefit. How do you think social impact can leverage brand? Just kind of like flipping that. Thinking through how they can work backwards and then gain any, any totally. From so how can so we've seen brands become tourists in social impact so they can look good or whatever and sell more product? How might social impact entities leverage brands to get people to to move in relative to their their idea? Right, that's the question. Do you have a nuance on this? No, 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 no I'm answering that. I, but the only example I can think of is red. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. That's exactly in my head. That's exactly it. Like Red created a brand in of itself that, like, hey, you want to be a part of this? You got to put in some coin. And Red kind of stands alone. And everybody next to them is sort of kind of like they're plus one. That's the only brand I can think of has done that very well. There is another, there's another brand that, another, it's a brand. It's not very well known. Have you heard of Thunderclap? So Thunderclap came out of an... The 70s rock band. Out of a, <laughs> it came out of an agency called Droga 5. Uh, Droga 5 is a like, very, very, very successful advertising agency. And what they realized is that the work they were doing for brands could be used for social good, right? For, for social impact. So they created this tool called Thunderclap where it's, it was sort of, it's sort of like um, uh, Kickstarter before there was Kickstarter. It's like I have a, a call, something that I am excited about and passionate about, and I post it and I ask people, will you be willing to post on my behalf? And you say, bet, I post on behalf of this idea. You say, yeah, totally I would. 
and everyone sort of like clicks on and say, yes, I agree, and I give you access to my channels to post this one thing. And then when I'm ready to spread the word, everybody who said they were willing to do it, it all happens at the same time, which is why it's called thunderclap, which is really powerful, right? Mm. This is activating the network of people who see the world similarly in an effort to create concurrence, which ultimately refers to the, the, ultimately catalyzes the network effect. But to your point, that's the only one I could think about is red. Yeah. So the example he's mentioning is, um, so, so Farmland is a client of mine. They're a pork manufacturer. I think they're probably the opposite of social impact. <laughs> uh, pork manufacturer that not a lot of people know about. Um, but Supreme, people know a lot about, right? Supreme is sexy, streetwear brand, blah, blah, blah. And typically these brands have nothing in common, absolutely nothing. That is, of course, until Supreme decided to steal Farmland's logo, which is what Supreme does. They don't care. They, they take IP. They're, in fact, their logo was stolen from an artist. They do not care. They have no Fs, right? Um, so on a drop they had in August of 2018, our team was like, you know, our team likes hype B stuff, like Supreme stuff. And they were like, yo, that's, that's Farmland's logo. What's going on here? And typically brands have three choices. You can either litigate before a brand like Supreme, you're just wasting your money because somehow they're just like Teflon when it comes to, to, to lawsuits. You can ignore them, which is what most brands do, or you can play along, which is what we decide to do. So um, in an effort to inject the brand to this cultural happening, um, we first tweeted at Farmland was like, hey, good hat. Like, you know, no one told us about the drop. Can we get a few of them? And they ignored us, as you can imagine. Then I was like, oh, man, and, you know, Farmland's trying to get it at, at, um, at Supreme. So then the next week, during the next drop, we created a lookbook of our own having farmers all dressed up in Supreme gear on the farm doing what they do all in Supreme. It's like a lookbook that we had on, on Instagram. And the hype beast culture just went bananas because they'd never seen anyone troll Supreme like that, but do it in a way that wasn't them trying to be cool and hip, but be in a way that was very much aligned to the cultural characteristics of, of the brand. And this is how brands participate in the culture in really powerful ways, right? This is cultural text. It's not just a product, not just an ad, not just a communication, it's cultural text that pushes the culture forward. And brands, organizations, institutions, <laughs> entities that are committed to social impact can do the exact same things. And we did that with no media, by the way. Would you say, I keep seeing um, things come up in various newsletters that I'm reading about this company or that company going carbon neutral by X date. Would you say that's another example of something like social impact? Um, I feel like that just keeps gaining in popularity. Sure. I think that that's, I think that is like normalization. This is almost what, what, what Jerry was talking about. That like it's becoming the normal that everybody's doing it. Right. And this is, I mean, this is how culture moves forward. People like me do something like this. Therefore I, right. It reaches a tipping point where it seems like the momentum is going that way. So, so that I'm not, you know, out of step, I align to, to what is normal. So one would argue, yeah, that, I mean, that's, it's all good. Whoever started that move from a corporate perspective, kind of created the, the, the domino effect, the ripple, the, the, uh, the network effect that we've been talking about to become, that's a normal thing that you do and before long we all just do this, right? Like no, no um, was that MSG, is that what it's called? Yeah. Mm. Like, like that, that became a thing that happened over time because it became normal to have, to not have that. All right, we have time for a quick last one. Yeah. Your computer went. Uh, so in terms of you talk a lot about like why brands work, right? And people that they consume a brand, they're actually they're not doing it like because of the you know the necessary brand, but they buy into the values and the principles. A lot of what we talked about today. Are there any like brands or companies that have just been outliers or exceptions to some of the rules or theories and kind of studies that you've had? And you're just like, man, like I don't understand why people are interested in X Y Z brand, but like there's some kind of is it the product in that situation? Or I mean, has there been any kind of outliers in, in what you've seen? Not, not yet, okay. right? And which is why I subscribe to the theory as, as wholeheartedly as I do, because I've, the phenomenon seems to fall into the, it falls into the, um, the provocation. And you know, the idea is that if you have a better product, you could still beat brands that are, but if you have a better product, you can 
not be culturally relevant, have a better product. And as and by having a better product and you dominate the market, you are part of the cultural zeitgeist. Right? But, the, but the challenge comes that as soon as someone's razor is sharper than yours, you are at risk. And the idea is that when people have heart loyalty, as, as one of our old colleagues used to refer to it, when people's identity are associated with the brand, even when the brand is just at parity, the product is just at parity, people will buy and buy a premium. Apple is a perfect example of this. The iPhone has been worse than the Samsung Galaxy, whatever that trash is, I'm joking, <laughs> has been worse than the Samsung product for at least three years, by far. But an Apple person will give you all the justifications of why they stay in the ecosystem, right? Because having an iPhone is a part, having an, be a part of an Apple product is a part of their identity, right? Um, so I haven't seen things run afoul to that, but I will say as a, um, a responsible researcher, like I'm constantly looking for those things and trying to find ways to break, to break the model, to break the, the provocation, which if it doesn't, only strengthens it, which is great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking time Pleasure. and uh, participating in the last public event at the University Fancy of Michigan. Fancy that, look at me. Um, appreciate me. it so much, thank you. <laughs>